Hello everyone, welcome to UGC Net Political Science classes by Drishti IAS. I am Dr. Ashwati. In the last class, we have studied about two concepts in political theory. One is justice and the one is rights. Okay. In this class, we will be taking up another three uh, concepts. One is democracy, then power and citizenship. All these three concepts are highly interrelated. Okay. Now, first we will start with democracy. We all know about democracy. We are living in a democratic country, right? Democracy simply means government by the people. It means that people actually choose their government. Okay. In ancient Athens or let's say that from the period of antiquity, the older times or the ancient period, democracy started as a direct participation of all adult citizens. When we are talking about adult citizens, here you don't find any universal adult franchise that we have. Here it was just limited to a few people, very highly privileged people. They formed this council and they had this deliberative democracy as well as they did participate and they made actually all the decisions for the prevailing political community. Women were not allowed, older men were not allowed, older women obviously not allowed, slaves were not allowed. So it was a highly class based society. Okay. Then after it differed from the representative democracies of the 19th and the 20th centuries, prominent theorists of the ancient world included the Plato, Aristotle, Polybius, Cicero, Augustine. Okay. Like Plato's idea was limited to that of the governing class. Who are the governing class? The guardian class. Okay. So they were trained in such a manner that only among those trained guardians you can choose your or you can actually arrive at your philosopher king. Now, Machiavelli, now I am just jumping to the earlier times of we can say the, the emergence of modern period. Okay, Machiavelli, he incorporated democratic ideal as one of the components of the mixed republican constitution. In his two works, one was uh, Prince, the Prince and the second one, the Discourses. In both of these, it was, the Prince was actually a transitional work, okay. Like he talked about, okay, you need a Prince who is be like uh, a very flexible king who has the qualities of both lion and fox. Means courageous as lion and cunning as fox, okay. So, this was for a transition because in his idea, Machiavellian's idea, it was that the society at that time was highly corrupt. So, there was a necessity to uh, make, make reforms in the society, to say political society as well. So, that you need a king who is actually uh, very highly courageous like a lion, who is capable of taking all the decisions with a firm mind as well as he is cunning like a fox. And end of the day, his idea was to have in his discourses, he has talked about a mixed Republican constitution. Okay, this was his basic idea. Okay. Now, individuals endowed with natural rights and liberties were the creators and the judges, a judge of the government. This was the premise or we can say the basic argument of social contract tradition. Okay, now we have many social contract thinkers, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau. We have uh, studied about them to the extent that what it is all about, creation of a society, like a political community, okay. Now, if we are talking about, uh, let's say that about Hobbesian way of creating a commonwealth, the Leviathan was above the political community. For John Locke, the system is, that, uh, that government is within, chosen by the trust among the people and uh, for Rousseau, it is something like every other person in the political community has a say or we can say that he talked about the direct democracy. Okay, every other person it will be like a kind of a system of referendum that you can find it here. Okay, so this is the basic idea how you can understand the social contract tradition of Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau. 
Now, since the 18th century, democracy became the yardstick to measure governments and regimes. So, what type of, as you know that uh, from the medieval times, you had a different, there was a, what we say, a predominance of the church over the state. Then after, there was a period when we had this absolute monarchies. It gave paved way for constitutional monarchies as well as simultaneously it gave way for the democracy. Okay. Now, principles of liberal democracy, the time when we entered into the first, uh, the classical liberal period, then after we had this modern liberalism. So, liberal democracy was based on the consent of the people. So, popular sovereignty, the people, the people of a political community, they will decide upon, they will choose the government. Okay. So, for John Locke, government as a trust to protect the natural rights, life, liberty and property. For Jeremy Bentham, a very famous utilitarian, the accountability of the governors to the governed. It means that who is governing? The ruling class has got an accountability towards the people. So, objective was to maximize the happiness, like have the greatest happiness of the greatest number, okay? Then after we have Dicey, majority opinion determines the legislation. Then after we have Bricey, the rule of the people expressing their sovereign will through the votes. So again, what we are seeing here, it is the power of the people. They are no more uh, subjects of a king, but rather they are citizens. Okay. Now, J.S. Mill on representative democracy, his idea he talked about introducing the open ballot, he also talked about proportional representation, he actually advocated that the right to vote to be given to every other class in the society, even to women, to extend it to women as well. His representative democracy, why? Like why he wanted this representative democracy to be promoted, he thought that by this, it is going to bring rationality in the state as well as it is going to improve the general population, their rationality, their reason because they will become part and parcel of the political decision making to a larger extent. Why? Because they are actually participating in the election. So, they feel that yes, we are also part of the system. Okay. So, government accountable to the citizenry and creates wiser citizens capable of pursuing the public interest. It means that when we are actually choosing our own government, we are choosing our leaders, our representatives, we are actually using our power like, okay, as well as we are actually looking up to the fact that, okay, why should I vote this person? Is this person going to be like, you know, doing some welfare for me or not? In that way, we are also made aware about the, uh, the about the cities, uh, the, about the functioning of the political system. Okay. Then we have Tocqueville. He talked about, he is a French, he was a French and uh, he has written this book called The Democracy in America, published in 1835. It was published in two volumes uh, about Tocqueville. He actually made a kind of um, like a comparative study or we can say that he, he analyzed about the democracy in America at the same time like he also analyzed that how the representative democracy got succeeded in America and why it was failing in other countries in the world especially in Europe especially his native France. Okay, so this was basically an idea given by Tocqueville, democracy in America, very important work. Now we comes the elitist theory of democracy. Very important one, very interesting one. Okay. So this was advanced by uh, three major Italian thinkers. So we have Pareto, Mosca and Michels. And these three thinkers of the 20th century as well as like, you know, we can say 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, they came up with the idea that in a, the government is not something comprised of the will of the people, but rather there is an elite out there who are actually the real wielders of power. Okay. So, first we will start with Wilfred 
Wilfredo Pareto, The Mind and Society, this was his book. And what is so important about the, his book, actually he made a uh, different, like a kind of, he gave the idea of circulation of elites. So, circulation of elites in this one, he is actually he divided between the governing elite and the non-governing elite. They are always in competition to get into that political system as well as, so they are actually in a kind of a, like what we say, always in competition with each other, the elite, the smallest group, okay. If this is the political society or the political that community that we have, elites comprise the most powerful people, okay. So, here you will find the governing elite as well as the non-governing elite, okay. So, they always constantly endeavor to replace one another. So, this is actually, they actually try to, so masses are actually untouched by this process. Everything is controlled by the elites, okay. So, there is a circulation of elites. Then after we have a... Uh, Gaetano Mosca, his work's name is The Ruling Class, published in 1896. This work actually gave the idea that how the, uh, there are two groups within the system, that, uh, so sorry, within this, uh, uh, this uh, political society or political community, they are actually the rulers and the ruled. Rulers and the ruled. Or let's say that rulers and the masses, okay. And he believed that uh, the leadership can actually emerge at all levels, including even at the grassroots level. So, each and every stratum, he actually created this rulers and the rule theory. Then after Robert Michels, he is known for, uh, like Robert Michels, his uh, work's name is Political Parties, a Sociological Study of the Oligarchical Tendencies of Modern Democracy. And his famous idea is Iron Law of oligarchy. So, under this iron law of oligarchy, Michel actually points out that in any organization that is set up with the democratic aims, but in every organization you will find a leadership or a group of people, they try to be elites, okay. Like they are the most power building people and they don't allow others to get into that position. You can see it in any political like associations, even in your like in your surroundings, let's say that your uh, residence associations, you will always see a kind of a group of people you will find there who are actually trying to be very dominating ones. Okay. So, it is like, you know, it is not that difficult to replace them. So, that is the reason why he actually has given this idea of iron law of oligarchy that rules out the possibility of circulation of elites as envisaged by Pareto and uh, especially by Pareto and later by Mosca as well. So, you have like once you have got that power, so you wish to be in that power, right? You see in cultural associations, you see the same in political association, many things where you can actually find this iron law of oligarchy in many things, even in trade unions, everywhere, okay. So, please students, please note down the names of these three, the three thinkers as well as the books, uh, the, the books published by them, okay. As well as the, the circulation of elites and iron, of, iron law of oligarchy, these two things were repeatedly asked in UGC net examinations, okay. Now, next we have here is democratic elitism. So, democratic elitism is something they have given a kind of, a, they did accept the fa fact that yes, these elites, they do exist. But most importantly, uh, they actually, uh, you can actually put them in that democratic sphere and they do wield power and they are like, you know, let's uh, take an example like sometimes these political leaders, they actually, uh, they like Joseph Shampito, he has given a kind of an idea that they needed to be uh, elected democratically within like let's say that intra-party democracy kind of thing. So, political leaders to be chosen democratically from within an elite social group within that group, you cannot actually minus these people, okay. You cannot just minus them because what we have seen here is that in a democracy political decisions are taken by the leaders not by the masses and these people actually 
create that aura of elites or we can say that these are the small group or the powerful group that actually has the power to take all the decisions okay so there is a free competition among the leaders for winning the people's votes as well so democracy is not a government of the people but rather than that it is a means to give effect to the will of the people but rulers comprise a set of individuals who are actually uh, they are not just you know they are not just the common people but let's say that they are the most powerful people okay so here we are actually reduced to the level according to the joseph shampita that we are just choosing the elites okay to govern us okay so joseph shampita gave this idea and his book's name is capitalism socialism and democracy other thinkers associated with democratic elitism are uh, karl mannheim his book's name is ideology and utopia Essays on the Sociology of Knowledge, 1928, Man and Society in an Age of Reconstruction, 1935. Then after Raymond Aron, he has given this idea of social structure and the ruling class. This was uh, published in 1950. He also gave a kind of an idea or he made a comparison between the USSR as well as that of Western society. So for uh, Raymond Aron, the uh, USSR actually gave the idea of a unified elite, those people, because in USSR you had many, like, you know, many, uh, like, you know, uh, countries were the, like, we can say that the current times, we can talk about the, Ch the Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Ukraine, uh, then after so many countries from the uh, Eastern Europe as well as Central Asia were there. But you must have seen that when you are looking up to the, uh, the leaders also, whether it is Lenin, Stalin, Nikita Khrushchev, Brezhnev, or we have this, uh, the last one, Maya Mikhail Gorbachev, all these people are actually Russians. They are all ready, they belong to the ethnicity of these Russians. And you, are, you haven't seen any leader of USSR from that of Kyrgyz origin or Czech origin, uh, sorry, the Kyrgyz origin or Tajik or like let's say that Uzbek or a Ukrainian, you haven't seen them. Why? Because there was a kind of an ethnic uh, majoritarianism was also there in terms of uh, power building in terms of in the USSR region. Okay, so in USSR state, there was a kind of a way that Russians actually dominated. So there was a unified elite that you can see out there and, and they were all bound together by the ideology. But in Western societies, you have a divided elite, like they are, you have different types of groups were there who were competing, uh, competing for the political power. So this is an idea by Raymond Aron. Okay. Then after you have Giovanni Sartori also, Democratic Theory, published in 1958. Okay, these are the main thinkers associated with democratic elitism. But Joseph Schumpeter emerged as one of the most prominent among them all. Okay. Then after the deliberative democracy, these are the types of democracies that we often see. Deliberative democratic theory, we have John Rawls and Jürgen Habermas who has given this idea. So, deliberative democratic theory is like that there is a need for more uh, like you know the participation of the people in the discussion, debates, etc. But we have this participatory theory also, participatory democracy where it has a kind of a more uh, expanded realm and it is it talks more about the empowerment of the people also despite it is not just about participation but more than that you are an empowered population okay then after procedure versus the substantive democracy so procedural by this it is not that you are having regular elections if you are having regular elections you are actually stopping there itself. So, that is more procedural. Okay. Substantive is the one where the government in itself is responsible towards the people's demands. So, let's say that we can take an example of Panchayati Raj systems in India. We have this Gram Sabha. Every other person in that Gram, like in that from that particular village is a member of that Gram Sabha and they do take part in the legislations. Okay. So, that is what we call it as a essence of the substantive democracy that is there in our country. Okay. Then after pluralist democracy, one of the most uh, favorite of mine, pluralist democracy, Arthur Bentley and Robert Dahl, they gave this idea. So, why is, uh, why is this theory more important? 
it is because of the fact that they are not saying they are they are not talking about these elites or anyone's but rather than they are saying that in a political power like in the in politics you have multitude of groups okay they all influence the political processes now in a democracy especially let's say that the interest groups are there pressure groups are there different types of associations are there they all make demands to the uh, to the system so they are like in a democracy so this is what robert dahl has to give this idea of polyarchy okay democracy is about polyarchy so this question also was asked in ugc net examination who among the following describe modern democracies as polyarchy robert dahl okay so b is the answer now we have another set of questions here so this is match the following okay so here you can find the names of the thinkers robert dahl c wright mills manker olson charles lindblom okay and the books by these people so we have to match them okay so now we have robert dahl he has written this book called a preface to democratic theory the logic of collective action okay so now then after we have this politics and markets so uh, this book was written by charles lindblom then after power elite obviously c right mills then after we have a preface to democratic theory so now this is actually very easy so uh this was match with robert dahl and then after we have this next book the public goods and the theory of groups so this is match with 3 mancure olson so just to revise so politics and markets this book was written by charles lindblom the power elite by c right mills a preface to democratic theory the logic of collective action was written by robert dahl public goods and the theory of groups was written by mancure olson so please note it down students there is a high possibility why if some question actually is uh, put in the ugc net examination from any of these writers okay now circulation of elites most closely refers to which one of the following okay this was asked in ugc net 2019 first is rotation of elites replacement of elites uh, retention of elites restoration of elites most uh, probable answer is this rotation of elites because they are actually giving like you know the governing elite and the non governing elite they are keeping on like you know uh, rotating like okay i next i have to next i have to okay so like that now politics uh, now we are going to discuss about the theory of power so power is something to make someone do something okay like it can be an action okay or like we have this capability of making someone work okay like our teachers they asked us to do the homework and because of the fear of the teacher we did actually we did that uh, things whatever they gave the assignment we were capable of doing that because we always had this fear dantegi ma'am i have to do it right like that so that is a simple way so politics is understood as a study of power so who wields the power who has the power to take control of the decisions all these things are actually part and parcel of the study of power okay in politics we often see that there are like decisions to be made then after like and we receive a demands from the society it is processed in the political system then they are sent for the output so now you can then we receive the feedback you must have read about the david easton's theory so here or in all these processes this is all about politics so who makes the decisions who actually takes the decisions who actually implements the laws all these things are part and parcel of the study of power okay so the dimensions of power when we are talking like political power formal and informal structures are there like uh, what sort of things actually like the institutions let's say that we have this uh, this legislature is there 
who makes the power and then after how we receive uh, like pressures from the outside also uh, through some groups through some social movements also informal and formal structures okay economic power who wills this is more a kind of a marxian idea that who has got the control over the means of production okay who actually controls the manufacturing production distribution etc okay so possession of material things ideological power karl marx on ruling ideas okay so the powerful ideas are called the ruling ideas whatsoever ideas prevalent in the society at that time becomes the ruling ideas then after let's say that the hitler's nazism uh, Mussolini's fascism all these things actually became the ruling ideas right and people actually blindly followed them then after Gramsci's hegemony he has created this theory of consent and coercion is the idea of hegemony is premised on these two one is based on consent okay like there are certain institutions in the society that are there for the consent, the religious institutions, schools, family associations, many things, okay, that actually influence our consent, but at the same time, we have this coercion also, that is the fear of the police or what, so the coercive apparatus of the state. Then after Louis Althusser's ISA or the ideological state apparatus. Cultural groups, many types of religious institutions all these influence our way of thinking okay they comprise the ideological state apparatus or the soft apparatus then we have this repressive state apparatus also where you have all these institutions of what we say police and many other things are there then after in terms of power also we have to study this elite theory i guess i don't have to like you know go through this Pareto, michel and mosca but c right means he has written in terms of what we say uh, he spoke more in terms of the american system where uh, three things actually the political economic as well as the military uh, personal actually they are these powerful those in the politics powerful those in the businesses as well as in military they formed a kind of an elite system in america and they have been very uh, for like very powerful in terms of decision making as well as in terms of political policy making etc this is what c right has uh, said in his uh, book called the uh, in, on uh, in his idea of power elite okay so then after we have this uh, james burnham is also there so burnham's theory is more about that all the functional powers is to be vested with that of the managerial classes not with the politicians as well as the businessmen so james burnham has tried to give a kind of an idea that uh, these people or let's say that uh, these um, managerial classes are more powerful that he has tried to showcase then pluralist concept of power i have already mentioned about robert dahl's polyarchy and his book's name is a preface, a preface to democratic theory who governs this was published in 1961 then we have charles lindblom's politics economics and welfare published in 1953 hannah arden's on human condition 1958 these all books are very important with reference to the pluralist conception of power and hannah arden's uh, uh, theories are also called as a constructive theory of power okay now we have authority concept of max uh, power by max weber he talked about three types of power one is the traditional charismatic and rational legal okay then after Stephen Luke's, uh, he has spoken uh, like uh, spoken about power, a radical view as pointed out to a third dimension of power. That means one is decision making power, then after non decision. making power and third one is ideological power
Now, which one of the following statement is are correct with regard to the theories of elite? First, James Burnham proposed the concept of circulation of elites. No, this idea was proposed by Pareto. Okay, so this is a wrong statement. See, right males, triumvirate, power group consists of political, economic and managerial classes. No, this is the wrong one. It was to be replaced by the military. Okay. So, this is also a wrong statement. Get on Mosca emphasized on the personal characteristic of elite. It is a true statement. Elite theory supports pluralism. No. So, this is also wrong. So, in this way, the answer 3 is correct. Okay. Now, next question. Oh, sorry. Next topic. And this is about citizenship. Citizenship simply means our membership to a political community. Okay. So, we all have this uh, citizenship like let us say that this is most visible in our Aadhaar card uh, for the US citizens as well as uh, they, they have the social security number they have. All these things actually showcase that we are the citizens as well as our voter ID. All these things like okay, we have this power, right? So, now we all are divided. We all are human beings whether the person living in uh, to, uh, like far off this Tuvalu, Togo or anywhere like okay or in a Tonga or in Vanuatu or in uh, South Africa or in Cape Verde or anywhere. We all are human beings but when we look up to the map we see clear boundaries right the political boundaries that are there and all these political boundaries display our but like you know our political uh, the, the nature of our political community that we have here. Uh, Let us say that a person Turkish, they have the citizenship of Turkey. Then after a person from Algeria, Algerian citizenship that person has. So, now all these ways, so it is simply a membership to the political community, right? So, the exponents of glorious revolution 1688 of England particularly popularized the idea of citizenship, okay? In the 18th century, this idea became more popular during the days of the American Revolution. And even in the ancient period also, in the Athenian system, the, the citizens were only a limited few people were there. The, the idea of citizenship proposed during the period of uh, Greek city-states are not comparable to our current citizenship theories. Okay, that's why I didn't explain them. So, only limited few people had the access to the political community in those days. So, let us come, come back to our modern period. So, idea of citizenship reaches Zenith during the French Revolution and the consequent declaration of rights of man and citizen. This declaration echoes the views of Jean Jacques Rousseau. Okay. Now, here liberal theory of uh, citizenship or uh, let us say that there are actually two major theories like Marxist theories as well as we have this liberal theory. So, my liberal theory T. H. Marshall is one of the most important exponent of the liberal theory of citizenship. So, T. H. Marshall explained about the evolution of citizenship in three stages. First, it emerged as civil rights constituting civil citizenship were evolved in the 18th century. Okay, like the emergence of right to vote, etc. Then after we have this political rights also, constitution, uh, constituting political citizenship were evolved in the 19th century. Then after we have the social rights constituting the social citizenship developed in the 20th century. Okay. So, these are the three stages that T.H. Marshall has analyzed that how we actually it was through an evolutionary process. Next, the Marxist theory of citizenship was provided by Anthony Giddens. He actually criticized T.H. Marshall's theory and uh, he is the, uh, Anthony Giddens is the chief exponent of this theory. His two important works are A Contemporary Critique of Historical Materialism 1981 and Profiles and Critiques of Social Theory published in 1982. And According to Giddens, development of citizenship and modern democracy began in the 16th century with the expansion of the state sovereignty and capitalism and the administrative buildup. So, this paved way for the extension of the state capacity for surveillance, which implied the collection and storing of information about the members of society. This type of supervision actually increased the state's dependence on cooperative forms of social relations. So, this was basically the idea of citizenship like there was an emergence of a change that political change you can see that 
the expansion of the state sovereignty and the administrative build up actually this uh, helped to uh, like you know further the, the there was a demands and then after later on also the way th marshall has explained about the citizenship like it's a very happy happy evolutionary one no for Anthony Giddens, it was through struggles were also there on the part of the people that they did struggle for getting all the citizenship. It was not a very easy cup of cake. Okay. Now we have a question here again. Which one of the following are correctly matched? Okay. Clash of civilization, Samuel Huntington. Okay, this is the correct one. Uh, J. Gaddis. No, this is the wrong one. End of history. Obviously, is associated with Francis Fukuyama. Correct. Green political theory wrong. So we have a uh, two A and C are correctly okay. So students, in this lecture, I have tried to give a comprehensive view about the three concepts of political theory: democracy, power, and citizenship. So, and I have also discussed about major theories which are there like, you know, the, the differences between these theories also I have explained as well as about the major political thinkers. So, students, these all thinkers are very important ones for the, for preparing for UGC net examination. The reason is that many times UGC net has asked questions from these thinkers and these three concepts are also very necessary with reference to cracking this UGC net examination. So students, thank you for watching my video. See you in another lecture. Bye.